reminder that we are being live streamed. So. If I change it from first point perspective to second, it would say, you were created to create. Now, before I begin into my presentation, I want to introduce a little bit about myself. Artistry and craft has been a very important part of my life ever since I was young, and I'm constantly seeking opportunities to express my creativity and passion. Just like in these photos, I currently take the pictures of close friends and family and turn them into realistic drawings. After high school, I hope to become an interior designer where I can infiltrate a, some of my abilities within the field of design. So, undeniably, it would seem that I would choose a project surrounding my gifts and talents. This year, I had broken my senior project up into three segments. One, creation, two, exhibition, two, creation, and three, exhibition. The first step is idealism. This is the portion of my research project where I began my research and thorough examination of my beloved passion of art. I wanted to understand how art was influencing the world, not only for myself, but for other people. How could I influence the world through my passion? And to take it even further, I wanted to understand how art, um, how, what the basic nature of man that was that inclined them to create art what made me want to create art? And I found these questions to my answers um, within the aesthetic theory. Aesthetic theory states that men are inclined to create art based upon their need and desire to um, make things beautiful around them. And through our feelings, we are able to recognize our recogni recognition of beautiful. Now there's a few key components to understand when thinking about aesthetic theory. One is of individualistic interest. Each of us is unique. We have our own passions, our own desires. We have our certain preferences, and that is how we recognize beautiful. Each of our ideas of beautiful is different. But because we are social ecological creatures, we also um, collaborate and we communicate our ideas of what is beautiful and that creates standards of moral and political bias. And this is where the terms popularity and trends start to come into play. Now it's also important to understand continual mutation. We are constantly changing all throughout history. We don't um, have the same idea of beauty. This would explain why perms and bell bottoms nowadays may not be seen as attractive as it once was back in like my mom's day. <laughs> So I did want to understand how art was influencing the world, because again, I wanted to understand what was my part in this life, what can I take beyond high school years into, per into a career. And I found a few key aspects that were very interesting to me. One is historic recollection. Historians and archeologists are constantly relying on art pieces, whether it be literature, music, or even physical, tangible art like paintings and drawings and that helps us understand history so we can progress as in our future. Another one is marketing. We are so successful in today's world because of the use of visual art within the marketing industry. Uh, we are constantly bombarded with commercials, with logos, with decorative packaging that increases consumer interest. It has been proven that the more we are attracted to the way it looks, we are more likely to buy the item. And so visual art is very important and crucial in the marketing industry. The third one is pedagogical practices. Pedagogical practices are your educational learning. This is where Dewey and Dow, when they were creating the um, educational system, 
They said that it was the most vital part of proper human life, and it increased education. It helps us to create innovative thinkers, and that's how we progress as society when we're thinking about things in a different way. Now the second part of my senior project was creation. This is the physical part, the hands-on part, where I began physically creating the artwork. And I enjoyed that part, that's my favorite part. So I want to explain a little bit of my techniques of how I create this. So the deeper the shadows and the brighter the highlights creates a more drastic tone. And I often use charcoal pencils because it creates such a softer and meaningful um, feel. Because I am doing pictures of close friends and family, it just puts a lot more meaning. And that's beautiful to me in my, in my understanding of aesthetic theory. And so the picture on the right, these are pictures that I have drawn. Um, I have my light source in a northeast direction, shining upon the object. And as you turn 180 degrees away, you'll have the darkest point at 180 degrees. Everywhere in between is the gradual increase and decrease of those shades. The more you blend, like using a tortillion, the more realistic it becomes. Understanding your light source is crucial. Without light source, we cannot see form. This is what transforms 2D objects into 3D objects. Another important aspect of art is the use of grids. Grids help improve accuracy. Um, instead of looking like at the edge of um, her skirt, instead of trying to eyeball it or trying to imagine exactly where it is in the picture, I am able to go to box B12 and understand exactly where it's at and create exactly the correct proportions. And before I even do that, I have to make sure each of the boxes, if it's two inches, I have to increase it by two to maximize the proportion. Now the third and final stage of my project was exhibition. This is the part where I began um, my performance of showing off all the hard work that I had done throughout my own time and also the time with my mentor. I spent countless hours with her and on my own time and I wanted to incorporate not only my own work, but also the work of the students of Little Springs High School. Because again, that the more we collaborate with one another, that's how ideas spread. This is how we understand beautiful. And I thought it would be great to inspire them and get them comfortable with the idea of sharing and performing and creating art themselves. So my project, I spent hours with my mentor matting all the pictures, helping her put them in correct, pleasingly uh, photos. And then we set up an appointment with Donna from the Ferguson building. And we had her, um, we did a $50 um, charge for the Ferguson building. And then she also did a $50 cleaning deposit to make sure that when we left the building, it was properly cleaned. And so we held the event on Saturday, January 30th from 3 to 5 p.m. And it was amazing to have the event take place in the Ferguson building because um, it was just so aesthetically pleasing. It was beautiful, just right downtown. And we had um, music and we had the um, refreshments to help increase the interest of other people and to make it more aesthetically pleasing in the environment. One of the greatest highlights of my project was probably the opportunity to be an, a gallery host. I was able to talk and communicate with others about my processes of how I created art. And they were artists themselves who wanted to know more about how to create art. And that is how ideas are spread and shared. I did struggle with finding announcements and trying to advertise the event as um, social media was a little challenging as well as there was a basketball game that night and so most people were in attendance of that but it was a great event overall and we had a great turnout and it was really beautiful the environment that we were able to create and I loved this year so much because I was able to think about who I was as a person to think about as I graduate what am I going to do for the rest of my life 
know, I want to be a contributing member of society. I want to do the best that I can and to incorporate some of my strengths because I do have a lot to give. And it made me realize of how much we all are able to give, whether we're teachers, we are constantly creating. We're mechanics, we are creating every day in our lives and we're trying to do the best that we can and that's how we're constantly progressing as we're creating. And that is truly beautiful because we are all trying to create life and improve it each and every day. And it was so neat because I finally found that I truly was created to create. Do my judges have any questions? Yes. Okay, so do you always use like the grid method or just when you're trying to be like super accurate? Uh, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Uh, typically I try to, especially when I'm giving it to friends and, and family, just to make it as accurate, especially if I don't know them very well, I can't really visualize those features. Yeah. And then you said charcoal is your favorite? Yes, charcoal is my favorite. Okay. It's very soft. And that, and I love how it, the tone of it is when I'm giving it to friends and family because it's very meaningful and personal. And also, what's neat about those pencils is they control the density within them. There's like a range from 2H to 6B, and the looser the density in the pencil, the darker the mark, the tighter the density of the pencil, the lighter the mark will be. And so it's kind of neat. I can control those shades a little bit better. What's your least favorite medium? Um. As an artist. Yes, things with color. I still struggle with color. But I this year it was kind of neat because as I was mentoring, I was practicing painting a little bit. I didn't have an opportunity to finish it for the art gallery, but I was learning about how to use color. Because I didn't want to just stick with things that I already knew. I want to expand and grow. And so that was one thing that was really interesting. But I do struggle with that one the most. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said you had fun with like being a gallery host and whatnot. Is that something you, that you wanted to career-wise, or do you kind of keep that open? Yes. So I found that as an interior designer, you are constantly performing in front of clients, and that's kind of how you are kind of expressing the way that you had created something. And I thought that was very similar to kind of being in an art gallery. I'm sharing my ideas and how. You know, I create a certain space. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank you. So much. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no first 
you that I would trust more than mine. Thanks for having me back. She's got you. Judges, you are welcome to take your packets with you <coughs> if you want, or you may leave them and take them with you.
opportunity to everybody. It made you stay at home and make relationships with your family instead of going out to big events such as going on a cruise or even simple things like sitting down at a restaurant. However, it opened up different opportunities. Opportunities to build family relationships. And that's exactly what I did. As cheesy as, as, cheesy as it sounds, I built a strong relationship with my family by making a short film. My mom, who in quarantine, told me I need to make a short film about anything I wanted. And so I went to my older brother, Wesley, and he said, we need to make a short film about a giant killer clownfish. And I thought, that was the most outstanding idea I've ever heard. And so there, there we were, filming a perfectly well-plotted movie about a killer clownfish. And although it didn't get critical acclaim, it didn't get 100% of Rotten Tomatoes, it didn't get 10 out of 10 on IMDb, it was something that I was proud of. It was something that I looked at, and I thought in 10 years, I'll look back at and smile. I'll smile because of the cooperation I did with my family and the cooperation that my mother gave to me through her film tip. And so, while my movie was strictly for entertainment purposes, movies don't have just that. They have benefits in, in classrooms. They have benefits in education. Hi, my name is Ben Clarkson, and we'll be observing educational value through film. Now, these values, these values, these morals, come from classes such as English and history, the ones I'll be talking about today. Let's start with English. Now, it can be taught through English in many different ways. However, the one I'll be talking about is themes and symbols. Based on different story structures, such as exposition, to rising action, to climax, from falling action, down to resolution. These directors will put themes and symbols within their movies, just like authors. In English class, you're taught over and over that themes and symbols are implemented within great novels so that it can portray authors' ideas. Well, movies are the exact same way. The movie I'll be talking about today is Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa. Akira Kurosawa is one of the greatest directors of all time. You might have seen some of his exemplified work through Star Wars, through the transition, through the sliding transition to different scenes. However, Kurosawa was the one who originally began with this idea. He implemented more than just a story. He implemented themes and symbols within his movie. These themes and symbols can be exemplified best through Katsushiro. Katsushiro was a samurai within the Seven Samurai who swore to protect a village from a group of um, bandits. And that's exactly what they did. Spoilers alert, they, were managed, they managed to fight off the bandits. However, the themes and symbols come when Katsushiro accidentally falls in love with one of the village girls. Now, at the time, samurai weren't allowed to have relationships, and that was a big problem. But towards the end of the movie, you might be wondering, did Kurosawa ma manage to resolve the idea? Did he manage to resolve the character arc? He, left the, he actually left the idea ambiguous. He doesn't actually tell you whether Katsuhiro falls in love with the girl or not, whether they get together. But instead, he implements an idea of duty in your head. 
the theme and symbol of duty and whether we should keep traditional value and traditional culture and throw it all away for a better life is put inside your head. You think afterwards that you need to discuss with your friends, should we follow moral and traditional culture even if it makes us have a worse life? And that's what Kurosawa managed to do. And that's what directors nowadays will keep wanting to do. Themes and symbols can be exemplified in newer movies, such as Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, where it shows a leap of faith and taking leaps of faith instead of just being the simple person you are right now. Another way it can be taught is through adaptations. Now, adaptation is anything that is adapted onto the big screen. However, for English, we're going to be talking about books and novels. These are books, books such as To Kill a Mockingbird, Schindler's List, any Stephen King book, it is popular for horror movies like It and, um, it and uh, Pet Cemetery to come out these days as it was a great novel. However, the one I'll be talking about today is Watchmen. Now, Watchmen is a graphic novel. Whether you take that as an actual novel or not, it's still, it's still on Time's top 100 best books of all time. And what happened is that Alan Moore managed to do more with the superhero genre than any person could beforehand. Whereas beforehand, everybody, every superhero was very morally tough. Everybody, every superhero was an out, outstanding character. Alan Moore flipped that genre. He showed these superheroes as morally, morally incorrect people. One example is Rorschach, the lead, one of the lead characters, was sexually abused as a kid. He was molested, and therefore it acts, it acts differently upon when he acts on villains. He will, he will provide different punishments in more brutal ways than a normal superhero, you would think a normal superhero would. Another example is the comedian who fought in Vietnam, and he takes that PTSD and, and all, of that, all of the ideas he got from Vietnam, and he portrays that onto the normal society, which you're not supposed to do. In 2007, Zack Schneider took this idea, took this comic book, and used it as a storyboard as part of his movie. He made this movie as par as in partnership with DC, and he managed to exemplify the themes that Alan Moore wanted to portray in the original comic book. So this is a great example of how we can take themes and symbols and through adaptation of comic books and regular novels into the big screen. Another, th another way is through adaptations of history. Now we'll be talking through the genre of history and the class of history. We have multiple different examples today. And when I think about adaptation, I'm thinking about historical contact adaptation. So historical con context is like Forrest Gump. When Forrest Gump <coughs> goes from the early 60s all the way to the early 2000s. So you see things like Forrest Gump goes through Vietnam, he goes through the Watergate scandal, all the way up to little minor details where he says he invests into a fruit company, which turns out to be Apple, and he makes a lot of money. He takes all, he, this movie, Robert Zimmick takes the, these um, events and manages to span it through a great movie. Second is King. King is a TV show made really quickly after the events of the Civil Rights Movement. However, the movie, the TV show King wasn't about it, his leadership as um, the social rights movement. It was more about his personal life. It was about his sexual misconduct, his affairs, and how he struggled in being the leader of the civil rights movement. And my last example is Saving Private Ryan. Now, Saving Private Ryan was almost rated NC-17. If you don't know what that means, is that no matter how, no matter how, uh, how many people you bring, even an adult, that you're not allowed into the theater unless you're 17 years or older. And it was because of the beach scene at the very beginning of the movie. It was very grotesque, it was very graphic, and the violence was just absurd. But it was absurd only because Steven Spielberg, the director, wanted to portray, wanted to portray actual warfare. He wanted to portray, portray the grotesque violence in warfare and why veterans get PTSD and why veterans have a hard time going back into society. And so that brings me to my product. I made a, I made a school shooting short film and training video. This training video was used um, to show the first responders around the area how, what the procedures were during a school shooting. I got this idea from Officer Moore. Officer Moore was my mentor. He also majored in film, which was really, really beneficial to me. I went up to him and I said, Officer Moore, what is one thing that we need to portray more, that I can make a short film out of, that we don't have right now? And he said, what we're really lacking is a sh uh, the, the right procedures for a school shooting. And so that's what I decided to do. I met with him for three months, and he explained to me all the exact major uh, major procedures of what every different um, branch needs to do during the actual event. And so when I got it all together, I made a script, and then I made a screenplay, and then finally we were able to shoot the movie. The filming process consisted of many different things. The first thing was recruiting all the cast members. 
I recruited all the first responders, which consisted of the, the fire department, the EMS, and finally the police department. When I got to filming, I received a lot more people than I thought I would. I had four fire trucks, two ambulances, and about five cop cars. And these were a lot more people than I expected. And so teaching them how to do everything and telling them what to do was a big struggle for me as I didn't expect that many people. So when I got, finally got done with all of the filming, which took about three days, three months to prepare, three days. And that was a ratio of a month to a day. And so for the first two days, I had just all my regular cast, cast members, all my friends, act from the beginning and the end parts of the short film. And I, as, because I wanted to use as little time of the first responders as possible, I had them only shoot one day. We woke up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we started filming around 7.30, 8, and then we filmed all the way until 12, in which the first responders left, and then afterwards the cast members, my friends, filmed a little more after that to get reshoots, and then we were done around 3 or 4. Then two more days were added just so that I could get all the scenes I wanted at the beginning without the first responders. So the filming process was really difficult as I was trying to lead all of my cast to do what I wanted them to do. And then afterwards, I gathered all of the footage and I edited it on my phone, which was a really difficult process. As I wanted to use a professional video editing tool, however, the computers here did not have the eligible RAM to do so. So obviously making a short film comes with a lot of challenges. And my biggest challenge was time management because in the morning of the big shooting day of all of the first responders, Officer Moore's tire blew out. And so I had to go towards his road, I had to pick him up, and he loaded all of the guns and all of the different props into my car. And he said, if I got pulled over, I'd better call him, because it would be really bad to have a bunch of these real guns with blanks in my car. Another, another challenge was continuity errors. Now, if you don't know what a continuity error is, it basically means you have one thing in one scene, and then you don't have another. Such as you have a jacket on in one scene, you don't have another, and you don't show them directly taking it off. That's a continuity error. And so at the very beginning, I tried to take away all these by telling all my cast members where exactly what you wore the first day of shooting as every other day, every other day we were gonna film. And so that kind of helped, but we still had kind of errors. And I tried to fix them all during editing, but there were still, you might still catch them if you watched the final movie. Finally, the editing process. The editing process was excruciating. As my phone, it's just a phone. It'll crash, it'll make you lose stuff that you worked on for a very, very long time. So after I finished all the editing, it took eight hours in total. And then uploading it onto YouTube took about five hours because I had slow connection. And actually, one of the fire department's members told me that I missed somebody in the credits. So I had to go back, fix the film, and then re-upload it, which took another five hours altogether. It was a very excruciating process, but I was proud of what I did. I was proud that I was able to make something that I'll look back on in future years. When people look at my film, I hope they don't just see a train video that can be used. I, see, I hope they see an accentuation of my passion, accentuation that I was able to use a blank canvas and make art on it. And when they look at that, I hope it reflects back on them and they're able to make art on their own blank canvas. Thank you. Might just have any questions. Does the school plan to use it? Yes, the school plans to use it. Officer Moore, I will give all of the footage to him, and uh, he, will, uh, he will edit it in his own way to show more um, of the first responders. To, um, so so it will be for staff? Yes, it will be for staff. Yeah. So uh, you didn't have a computer at home that you could have uh, purchased an editing program? So I did, I did have a computer at home, and Officer Moore was able to um, get through a deal for Black Friday, I think, um, final uh, Premiere Final Cut Pro, which was is like a professional. However, my computer kept crashing when I used it, so I finally had to stop. Okay. Um, it was a lot of work, and it just kept crashing. So, what program did you use on your phone? iMovie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not alone there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Officer Moore. And. Um, did you research any like documentary stuff? That was kind of my, one of my interests in college. Yeah, I, I researched a little bit about document documentation and stuff like that. All right, I'm going to test you a little bit. Okay. So, um, what do you think was the major turning point in documentary filmmaking? Do you think it was the cinema verite movement of the 1950s and 60s? Well, that did played a big like major part. I think it goes all the way back to like the 1920s with Kino Procta. Kino Procta was a Soviet's way of using newsreels to portray the news. 
And so while that, while that was a big part, um, I think it transferred, the biggest part was when it transferred to World War II. World War II, in World War II, um, the draftees and the military actually had to um, hire Hollywood produ producers and directors, and what they did was they filmed training videos for the draftees because there was such an abundance of them that they couldn't train them all with different sergeants and lieutenants. They just basically showed them the um, training videos instead. Pretty good answer, half credit. <laughs> So the video is up on... The video is up on YouTube, however, I don't have all of the consent forms back. Obviously, I need to give consent forms so that um, I can show them on, on uh, the internet. However, it, if you have a link, you can watch it. I, I can send any of you guys a link to short film.
Good for you. Um, we're taking the cabin and we're going to be doing nightly rentals on it. So I called Andrea and she says, okay, but I haven't got back to you. you know? And I said, well, I'll be there. I'll see your project next week. So as a child, I'm sure many of you also enjoyed the things I enjoyed. Maybe some different generations, but puzzles and mazes have been around since as long as anyone can remember. And they've always brought me joy, so I thought it may be a little fun to bring some other people some of my interests as well. Hi, my name is Ethan Rich, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Box of Secrets. So what we're going to be starting off is uh, how puzzles, codes, and such were used throughout history, with starting with Julius Caesar, one of the first known cases of using ciphers, and ciphers are different forms of code and hidden messages. They actually called him Cypher Caesar because that, he was one of the very first people to invent it. He would take a rod of a very specific diameter and have two of them, and then on the first rod he would wrap a leather belt around it and then he would write a message take it off, and then a soldier would wear it as a belt, take it to wherever the message was needed, and no one would suspect a thing because it just looks like a belt, and then the general would wrap it around the rod, and then he would read the message, and it would be something along the lines of, move the troops here, or we attack tonight, something along those lines, and no one would be, none be the wiser on what would happen, they just think it's a belt. So, and then, uh, they were also used in treasure hunts like pirates and such, and you also read those in books. And I also enjoyed reading in books about like hidden treasures or say like you were heir to a fortune, but only if you could solve like the like trail of clues. And then once you finally got to it, the clues lined up to read a message and then you could finally uh, get the get your heir, your inheritance. And I always thought those were really cool. And people also seem to have thought that because they also started doing treasure hunts where they would write certain clues and hide millions of dollars worth of gold in mountains. And there's some that people still haven't solved today even though they were started in the 1800s. Uh, and then uh, with like treasure hunts and such, those are still used today. People are still finding them or like sunken boats and such, they would patch together the mysteries of what happened to find out where they sunk and then they would find the remains, such as like the Titanic. They patched together where they were supposed to be going and then they found it there. We also use it in messages like texting, email, Facebook, anything really technological wise, even ATMs. With ATMs, you have to type in a specific set of numbers to get your money, so that way not just anyone can come in to your bank account, empty it, and it's their money now. But, so you have to type in your own code, so you get your money. And with messages, each message has a very specific code written into it, so that way only the intended person receives the message. That way it's not like, I'm coming home for dinner tonight, Mom, and it goes to everyone. No, it only goes to that specific person. And with that, you have to have, it's very important to keep things uh, secure. And with the importance of security, it makes you feel safe, secure. And you're not scared when someone's, you know, they don't feel safe, they're scared, they're worried, uh, they don't feel like, they feel like they're gonna get attacked. But if you have your privacy, like with what, door, with what ring doorbells have done, uh, originally, it was just you had one password and then you could get in and people would hack into those and then they would watch through the cameras, start speaking through them, and if you hack into a ring doorbell, you can actually wind up going into all their personal information. And 
through that, they learned that they needed a two-factor authentication. And with that, you would have to have two different types of passcodes, like you would have to answer things like your mother's maiden name, favorite dog, stuff like that. You'd have to patch together different parts of your past that no one else would know. You solve that little maze puzzle, if you will, to get in there, and then you start to feel safe. And then schools in uh, about Illinois, of Chicago area more specifically, they would get hacked into often because they weren't as secure with their firewall. Our um, tech guy, um, Andrew Corson, talked about how the firewall is a set of codes and only certain codes can get into it and through it so that way not just anyone can get in, read the emails, it's only personal and only you can see them. So it, so that way privacy is not getting leaked, like where you live, your number, who your parents are, your social security. That way you stay safe and you feel secure. So with that in mind, we already talked about the importance, but you also feel protected and without them there would be no privacy. So with my project, I wanted to sort of bring awareness to that while also bringing in the fun of like treasure hunts, putting together different clues to open the final box at the end of the story, and bring in that joy. So I thought that with a box that you couldn't open unless you solved a maze, it would be like not being able to get into an email without a password, while also you know having fun with a maze, because I always enjoy mazes, no matter how easy or difficult they are, frustration, just have fun with them. And I thought it'd be a fun way to bring awareness. And while doing so, I had plenty of challenges with pieces. I had to recut them multiple times. I used a laser printer, actually. And with the laser printer, uh, the, the, you had to increase the strength of the laser if it wasn't properly fitted for the wood that you were using or material. And they wouldn't cut the proper size, or I had to recut a different piece to be a little bit bigger or smaller to alter it to be for my specific box. And I also had to sand things uh, if they wound up being too big, but I couldn't cut them down smaller with a laser cutter or any other tool. I just sand it down so that way things would work smoothly and they would glide easier and they wouldn't get stuck. I also, I also had to do with time. I took multiple days to figure out precisely what kind of box I wanted to do. And then the cutting, recutting, that took a lot of time because my mentor was Mr. Knapp. He's a teacher here and I had to work around his schedule and mine as well. So figuring times after class or in between classes to cut those and such and talk to him about specific portions, that took a little bit of time to deal with. Also, uh, right here, there's a very important key piece that holds it all together. If you want, you can actually look at this. This key piece right here is used to hold it together so it doesn't fall apart, but I actually had to remove one of them or else it was too tight to move. So even if you have very important pieces that the box will not function without, just you can get rid of one and trial and error until it works. So I've also learned plenty of things along the lines of making this. I learned patience because you can't just get frustrated with it and throw it against a wall, as you may want to do plenty of times, uh, or else you just got to restart again, like I did multiple times because I had to recut things, or if I put it all together and something wasn't working, I'd have to take it apart until I found the piece that was working. At one point, it was the very beginning piece, <laughs> which was awful. And then I also learned a great appreciation for the people that make these for fun because it was really complicated to put together. Even though that this is actually a relatively simple box to put together, there's much more complicated ones and people make them for fun so that way people also enjoy them. And I, I don't see how you could do that all the time. I had enough trouble making just one. And I followed directions on how to make this particular box and I followed them straight to a T by the millimeter and as you saw, I had to get rid of like a main component piece. And they don't always follow directions, so you sort of gotta take it where the wave takes you. Well, 
it's been wonderful talking to you all about an awareness of things that's very important with a way of also bringing in a little childhood fun of doing some mazes. Uh, thank you. My name is Ethan Rich. Do my judges have any questions? Well, um, I'm just wondering where you found the design for your box. Uh, it was on a site called Uncraftables because they have plenty of different projects you can do. They have different sections like woodworking, CNC, laser machines, stuff like that. And we were, um, Mr. Knapp and I were talking about puzzle boxes and how fun they can be. And we we're like, hey, we should do something like this. And so we were looking online and then we found one. And we're like, that one seems relatively simple, but also pretty neat. And so um, where did you find a laser cutter? Uh, Mr. Knapp actually has a laser cutter. He uses it for, <laughs> he uses it for different things for the school as well. Mm -hmm. Anytime a student or a staff member has something that they want engraved on something or cut out, he'll usually just do that. I also have a laser cutter in Bowtech, oh, so okay. I could use that as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Can you demonstrate how to open your box? Uh, yes. Could I? Yes. <coughs> So there is actually a piece on the side here to where you can move this middle piece, which actually was originally made of wood, but it kept breaking any time that you would bump it into the walls of the maze, like right there, it would break. So I actually took a piece of a Barbie microphone stand and glued it in there, and it seemed to work a lot better. <laughs> yeah, so that was another challenge I faced. But yeah, so it actually starts off all the way at the bottom of the box, and then you have to work it, move it, until you hit the middle. And then once you hit the middle, you can move this piece forward, this piece backwards, and it actually moves these, which unlatch from this portion. And then after you get it to the middle, you solve the maze, you move the pieces where they unlock, and then you can open the box, put whatever in, undo the maze. Uh, any other questions? So did you keep track of your time in making this? How long did it take? Uh, it, took, it took multiple days because I stayed after school a lot uh, he, since he had class periods. I also, in the first semester of the year, West Plains didn't have school on Fridays or yeah, they didn't have school on Fridays, so we had so we would come to school at well, we would get out of school technically at 10:45. So I would spend a lot of time in there and we would be discussing different types of puzzles or what not to use and we we're discussing different things that we could do. And was this one of the more simple designs? Yeah, this was one of the more simple designs because we wanted to start with something simple and if it was uh, like a little too easy, we were gonna up it to where it was something relatively more. But this wound up being kind of complicated to put together, more so than you would think. Anyone else? Right. Thank you. Where would we find? 
to me.
Did you get your? Yes. Caleb, are you ready? Yes. All right. Again, firearms and safety is sealed for you. Okay. You may take it away. Are my judges ready? When I was when I was younger, me and my brother Stephen, we went out and shot an old hunt, an old rifle we had at a steel target that was about five ten yards away. We were shooting hunting load out of it, and when we shot it, a piece of copper jacket came back and hit my brother Stephen in the hand. That day, told me that that day was one of many days that told me that I needed the help uh, steady firearm safety. Hi, I'm Caleb Johnson, and I'm here to talk about firearm safety. And to continue on with experiences and one I've been told, my dad has a twisted finger. Uh, what happened was he was shooting a shotgun and one of, the, one of the rounds he was shooting was loaded too hotly and it caused the shotgun to explode and it nearly took his right, uh, not the right, left index finger off. And my personal mistake when I was young, I was shooting a lever action rifle, it has an exposed hammer, and I was playing with the hammer and trigger and I accidentally shot the rifle. And then a little later on, I went to go try hunting again but I was shaking too much and I accidentally shot the rifle again and some general firearm safety rules. Treat that gun as if it's always loaded. It's imperative that you always do, even if you check it a million times, because there's always that one chance that it is. And it's best off, better safe than sorry. Identify what's behind that target. You don't know what's behind that target. It could be a cattle, it could be a family member. member. You don't know, so check what be, what's behind the target at all times. And some just health safety, lead, which is you, which is commonly used in firearms, is uh, dead uh, harmful to the body. It can stay in the tissue, kidney, and brain for about 30, 40 days, and can stay in the bones for up to 20 years. So when you're done shooting your guns, wash your hands, especially after you're cleaning it, because if you're shooting lead bullets. You're going to get some lead shavings out of that gun, so clean your hands. Uh, wear some hearing protection. <coughs> hearing protection is just generally anything, ear earphones, uh, phone plugs, headphones, stuff like that. It's best if you do it because it's because every single time you shoot a firearm, it will cause your ears to ring. And it's been said that uh, whenever your ears ring, it's a sign that you're that you probably damaged your hearing. If you're new to firearms, what I would suggest to first start off with, for a shotgun, I would suggest either with a 12 or 20 gauge. A 20 gauge, personally, because you can get it in lighter loads, and it's ultimately a smaller cartridges, and it's something you can also teach youth with. For a rifle, I would first start somebody off with a 22 rifle, you can get 22 in any kind of style of rifle, so it's really a good starting rifle for anybody. My steel target, I made it because it was to help practice safety. Whenever you go out to a target range and you practice, and you practice safety, whenever you're out in the field, it'll help ensure that whenever you're out in the field, it'll help encourage that safety of yours. And in general, I thought it was a fun project to make. How I made it was here, steel tubing, and this one I made it using steel tubing and a rebar going across with piping, using old galvanized pipe to weld down and weld onto a metal disc. I used a plasma table to cut out the disc and I used washers to prevent it from walking side to side. The legs on both sides are of course loaded to that but they also have a support beam on both sides. One <coughs> side has also more supports on the top. 
On this side, it's welded a little funky, but I will mention that later. The challenges and what I learned was, the challenges was I just really did not know what to do. Sometimes I would not know what to do and just be kind of blocked. You know, have a, what am I supposed to do kind of thing. And, and I had design falls like this right here. I never changed it because I thought it was a funny little thing to talk about. And it also taught me skills as a, in fabrication and MIG welding. Uh, and the aspects of fabrication, it taught me to cut, measure, and precisely put the things in the right spot. As a MIG welder, well, fabrication often goes with MIG welder. So those two sometimes go hand in hand. With this, the steel target that I made will help me and my brother Stephen from preventing an incident that happened that one time a long time ago from happening again because we are now practicing safety. Instead of standing five, 10 yards away, we're standing about 20 to about 15 yards away and we're only shooting flat nose bullets and no longer hunting, mode, hunting rounds. This will help encourage us to ensure more safety in the future. Does my judges have any questions? What's the thickness of your targets? Let's Quarter inch. You make this up at school, up there? Uh, Votech. Votech? Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. Did you use any kind of special steel for the targets? No, I think it's mostly just industrial model steel. Uh, in general, it does uh, does the job well with any flat nose bullet, like 20, uh, well, 22 is a round nose bullet, but 22 are. But in general, it just pretty well stops anything that has a flat nose bullet. I've even shot with a 44 mag and it's done fine. Or, I shot the other target with a 44 mag and it's done fine. I made two. How many of, you, of these have you made? Uh, two. One's a silhouette target. I completely forgot to mention that. I complete. I I, I forgot a lot about my project while standing up here. I forgot a lot. That's ended up there on one of them slides. Yeah, I was going to talk about it, and then it just, I guess, just nervousness got to me. Sure. Is that target? Does it have a centerpiece? Does that centerpiece come out? Or? Yes, it does. But I guess nervousness got to me. In, in it's fine. It's fine. No worries. We all understand that. Yeah. Have, any, have any plans to make one so it's taller? Uh, higher, the targets are higher up. Yeah. This one I think is just fine. Uh, the silhouette target does that just fine. It's pretty tall, so it's about the same height as me. So. This some. Um, uh, Learn safety and all that. Uh, you look and go anywhere with it, like uh, any, any presentations to anybody or no. like lower in elementary or uh, no. observation days or anything like that. No, I've never done that.
I'm not as good as David. Well, I was in here for it. Oh, yeah. 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 As soon as I heard you ask, I was like, oh, man, I don't think I'm going to ask you. I was going to be too. Yeah. I, wish, I wish I was cool enough to talk to myself, but I oh, can't cool. do it. Yeah. Should have been at the fair. We teach you that. I want as much pressure to do That's an actual title. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, I feel like I did both times. Apparently, according to Terry, I already got to way too many hobbies, so it's just more 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 fun. I just wondered how you get one to do it, so. I don't know. <laughs> it kind of just happens. I'm not a big planner. Something happens, something happens. Seventeen still. Yeah, that's all right. What's this project? You just you missed you missed the one you should be here on. This is this is six twenty. You got six forty. We be here too. Oh, okay. Well, what's this project idea? I'll just one too. But this is all right. Yeah, we're missing one. Twelve twelve fifty five. Thank you. We're missing one of the other judges anyhow. So I'm a teacher. I'm used to doing more than I'm supposed to. Indeed. Always going to be the overachiever, aren't you? Twelve fifty-five, right? Mm -hmm. Seven fifty dollars. Seven fifty in my mind. Mr. Cody, are you um, ready? Are, are the judges ready? No. Most I think no. because maybe because it's not on my schedule, it's not taking my judge ID and project ID. You may not. Twelve fifty-five. Yeah. All right. I'll just put it on this number. You probably saw that cheaper a couple years ago. Just hang out. Maybe had more reserve. You might. You just put you might and put a note in there. Sounds you. Yeah. All right. Now, are we ready? I think it would work. My judge is ready. Hi, my name is Cody Ward, and today I'm going to be taking you through the worldwide benefit of fishing. Now, I want to start with a quote from someone who might not be the best role model for a lot of people, and that's Hank Hill. Now, Hank Hill talked to his son, Bobby, one time about fishing. Bobby didn't want to go fishing with old Hank, so Hank tells him, Bobby, it's not, it's not the, the fishing that really matters. You know, whenever you go fishing, you cast your line out, and all, this, all the worries that come with it are gone. You don't have to worry about politics or taxes. You, all you have to worry about is whether you're going to hook a fish or not. And um, I really want to iterate that, reiterate that throughout the entire uh, slideshow here. So first, I'm going to be taking you through the therapy of fishing. So 
As you can see here, I caught an absolute monster on Lake North Fork, and I'm going to be touching on that later. Um, the first thing I'm going to take you through is relationships. Now, um, when, growing up, I didn't have the greatest relationship with my dad. Uh, I grew up more of an athlete. He didn't necessarily grow up like that. He's always been a really big farmer. I didn't really see the potential that farming has and the joys of farming like he did. So unfortunately, I grew up playing a lot of sports. He was working on the farm. We never really got a bond that really was as tight as it is now. But then fishing came in, and I, I hated I hated fishing. I, I, it was just pointless. It was just a waste of time. There's no reason to do it just to throw something back, and that's all I ever thought about until one day he took me to Lake Norfolk and we hit the hybrid striped bass and um, it was probably the most fun I've ever had and I'm really thankful he dragged me out of the house that night. Uh, the, next, the next thing I'm going to be talking to, talking to you about is Project Healing Waters. Now this is a therapy nonprofit in Minnesota by, ran by a guy named Dwayne Cook. He takes veterans or really anybody that kind of just wants to get away from the real world and take some fishing, fly fishing, they uh, make their own lures and they fish for trout or really anything that will bite. So that's just one of the very many nonprofit organizations that uh, fishing pr has provided. And um, the lifelong memories. Now, now is whenever I'm going to touch on that absolute monster I caught at the beginning. Um, now that fish obviously wasn't the, wasn't the fish that you should be the most proud of, but actually it's probably the fish I am the most proud of because the look on Dad's face whenever I set the hook on that thing thinking I caught the state record and I threw it over the boat <laughs> because my lure was bigger than the fish itself it was something else. Um, so whenever I think back, I'm, I'm not going to think, wow, I caught this little dink of a fish and I just put it back for no reason. I'm going to think about what dad looked like whenever I threw, the, threw, it, over the, <laughs> threw it over the boat and um, all the times I've spent in the weeds and listening to the trolling motor just cut up the trees underneath us because dad got his bait stuck again in the, in the trees. Now the, um, this is actually the, just the haul that we got. As you can see, these are some pretty big fish. These are actually the hybrid striped bass um, and quite a bit of food there and we really enjoyed catching them because they put up a fight. The next thing I'm going to be talking to you about is the little resources. Now, obviously fishing is very, very big in the world because of the, uh, the protein it provides. Now, according to the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 97% of the world's protein intake is actually from fishing. So that's not necessarily the United States. Like around here we eat beef. We eat pork. Now, whenever you go to China, you go to places like that where they rely heavily on sushi and fish, it's, it makes up 97% of the world's protein intake. And in 2019, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations again, we caught over 400,000 tons of crab. Now, that's a lot of crab. Crab aren't necessarily the biggest fish, and actually they're, they're not really fish, they're crucians, but Whenever you harvest them, you might not get the most meat, but whenever you have 400,000 400, pounds of anything, you're going to get quite a, bit, quite, a, quite a bit of food off of it. Now, catfishing is something I added in here, mainly for people around here, because we might not be able to go crab fish on the big tankers like the Time Bandit, or we might not be able to go catch just tons and tons of tuna on the ocean, but we can catfish. Catfishing is something that a lot of people around here do because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of relaxing. All you got to do is throw it out, hope something bites, reel it in, and harvest it. And just about it, if you go to any fish shack, or fish shack or anywhere that serves food, you'll be able to get some fried catfish. Now, this is something I added here purely for me because that is an absolute ginormous fish, and I wanted to show it off. As you can see, there's got quite a bit of meat on it right there, and um, that's just one example of how much, how much meat you can actually get off of a fish. Uh, now, my project, unfortunately, my project the first time was turned down. I wanted to take a group of kids and fish, teach them how to fish due to COVID. I couldn't, so um, I made four videos, how to rig, how, how I rigged just a couple of my baits, and one of them is actually, I have in my pocket right here, it's actually called, it's a Senko, it's a Texas rig. Uh, this is mainly used for bass because I fish mainly for, for bass. Um, I also took you through how I set up my crankbait and uh, what they catch, so I take you through how to fish it, just talking about how to fish it. Um, where to fish it and how quickly and how slow to fish certain things and then I actually show you out in the pond how to fish it and um, just take you through the motions that I do and the thing is in my videos I, I reiterated quite a bit is you don't necessarily have to listen to everything I say fishing is purely based off what works for you and that's what makes it something that's really beautiful is that you know, I can, give, I can give you all the tips. I can tell you what I catch my biggest fish on. I can tell you what I catch the most fish on. But really, 
you can take that information and you can customize it just about any way that you like. So if I tell you I like a Texas rig with a Senko and you think a June bug would work better on there and you try it out and it works better for you, that's awesome to me because I gave you the tip for the Texas rig but luckily you changed it into what you like and what works for you. And then of course, nothing is ever complete without food so I had to, make, I had to throw in a catch and cook video. We uh, cooked up some of those striped bass that we caught and we fried it up, had a pretty good dinner that night. Um, now the hardships that came with this project, there are actually quite a few. Uh, one of the biggest ones was late closing. So whenever, whenever COVID hit, nobody really knew how to take it. A lot of things shut down and unfortunately we couldn't go to our normal spots in order to fish. So late closing was a big problem. We tried and tried, but unfortunately we never got the time to go to those lakes that we normally fish. Uh, the next is the spawn period. So bass, whenever they spawn, they set up beds. And the spawn period for bass is actually normally in the spring, which was kind of unfortunate because I was assigned this project in August. And I didn't necessarily have time to get it done in the spawn period, which is whenever bass catch them or bass eat the most. So I didn't necessarily get the best bass bites because of this spawn period and it was off time. So that, that was unfortunate. And then there was that little that little sliver where Mother Nature tried to kill us all whenever she gave us way more snow than we could have ever bargained for. Now, with those lake closings, I couldn't go to the lake, so I had, I had to rely on our backyard pond. And our backyard pond was frozen over for a long time, unfortunately. So um, luckily, just a couple days before I had to have it turned in, I had, the, uh, I had the old pond unfrozen, and I was able to get my lure in the water and fish some, and maybe help everybody learn a couple things. Now in conclusion, I know fishing for a lot of people is not at all what it seems, or I know that a lot of people have a really bad outlook on fishing. You know, you, you pay a bunch of money, you throw lines out, you reel it back in. If you don't catch anything, you don't catch anything. But if you do, you just throw it back in. It seems really pointless for a lot of people that don't know the bigger aspect of it. For me, fishing is more. I wanna, it, I wanna show that fishing is the nature that comes around it. Fishing is, is the memories that come with it and um, I know that Hank Hill is not, again, the best guy to rely on, but I, I want everybody to maybe look into it as more of um, a fishing aspect, and Hank Hill, whenever he says that all the worries go away with whenever fishing comes. So if the last thing I want to leave you with is something my grandpa's told me for as long as I can remember, and that's that if it was called catching, you'd catch something every time, but it's called fishing. So you've got to look at the greater aspect of it. Do my judges have any questions? What else do you um, fish for? Is it like do you fish for crappie or um, bluegill or anything? Really, I kind of just fish for whatever bites. I, I like catching fish no matter what it is, but if I was to target one thing, I always, I would usually target largemouth. Uh, if I'm in a rock area, I'll try to target smallmouth. Um, I'll take anything that bites, really, though. I, like, I just like the fight that comes with them. So. You mentioned some of those professional fishers. You know Mr. Clung, the local guy? No, I don't. He's from Avon, Missouri. I, I, I guess I need to start branching out a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe really get some action. He lived, I mean, he lives over there, yeah. I need to start, start branching out. Do you use on your videos? I mean, yeah. Uh, I haven't actually posted them yet. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I need to get them posted, but it takes forever to render, and I don't even really, I don't, I'm not too good at all that stuff, so I haven't, I haven't gotten to that part yet. But hopefully, one, eventually, I, I'll be able to. Have you ever thought about fly fishing? You know, um, if we were to fly fish, I'm sure it would be for trout. And me and my dad actually had plans to fly fish on December 24th. Um, the super nice people at the organization that we were going to go fish at, they let their employees go home early, so we had to cancel our um, cancel our reservations to go fly fish for some trout. But uh, I want to. I'm sure it's just another challenge. Um, as you know, whenever you start, you start with a little Zebco and you work your way up to an open face or a uh, spinning reel, and then. From there, if you want to get pretty serious about it, uh, you go to open face reel, and that's what I fish with. Uh, it took, took me a while to learn how, but the next step is definitely fly fishing. Yeah. Don't your dad let you take the boat out to the lake by yourself? And Still working on that. Really? <laughs> if there's anything that you can say that you think would help, I appreciate it right now. I'll make sure to relay it to him because I'm sure he won't hear it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious. Did you learn to cook these fish? I did. I'm actually pretty. I'm, I'm a pretty good fryer. Uh, we actually have an unspoken law in our family that whenever the fryer turns on, the ochre goes in. So, pretty good fish or frying hush puppies, fish, 
Um, we fried some deer. We fried pretty much pretty much anything you can throw in, in batter and fry it. We've tried it, and um, I've gotten pretty good at it. So yeah, that, <laughs> branched out quite a bit in the fry because I like food a lot. Mm -hmm. Is your striped your best eating? Stripe the striped bass. It's kind of hard to tell the difference between a lot of different fish whenever you fry them, but yeah, it's really good. I really like it. I did find a barbecue sauce. Everybody makes fun of me for it, but I like it. <laughs> Is that it? Thank you, guys. Oh, Aubrey, are you been keeping my time? What it was? Eight
His wife taught here. My wife was a sub here for a while. Yes. Okay. What else we got? I'm just assuming. I'm not there. Surprisingly, I'm not a teacher. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Rose is on Yeah. Yeah. Back there in the back. Yeah. I've been off the scene. I've been doing it. Where's your wife? No. No tell. Protection. Specifically, eye protection. When welding, 
Visible ultraviolet rays and non-infrared rays are produced, which can damage the eye if, if looked at without without any eye protection, such as a welding helmet and or welding goggles with a mixture of red and blue lens. Another safety that I'd like to point out is the clothing. You need, in order to weld, in order to weld safely, when, excuse me, when welding, if hot falling sparks are occurred, which can burn your can burn through your clothes and onto the skin. That is why I prefer to wear leather-based clothing and non-open-toed shoes such as boots, and also to wear welding, welding gloves, which is a leather-based based material to protect your hands from hot falling sparks. The last safety that I'd like to point out is a ventilation system. When welding, fumes are, are produced, which are very injurious to a human if in that is why it's necessary to have a ventilation system. A fume that I'd like to point out that's usually produced when welding steel is chromium. Chromium, if inhaled, can make you sick and or potentially be fatal. There are many types of welds, and all of them are good welds, just depending on what type of metal you're welding on and the use for that type of weld. The all types of welds consist of groove, flange, flay, surfacing, plug, slot, stitch, and a tack weld. I used, I, I used tack weld, stitch weld, and a surfing weld on my product. I used a tack weld to adhere two pieces of metal together, allowing it to hold itself without, holding, without me holding and trying to weld it with a surface weld. I chose to use a surface weld because I thought since my product is using a lot of pressure to operate it, I wanted a nice, good, strong weld to it. I then used a stitch weld on the pieces that didn't acquire as strong of a weld. The types of welder out there consist of a tape weld, a make weld, a stick weld, and a flux core welder. I used a MIG welder on my product because I use steel, which isn't that thick, and I wanted to be able to adjust the temperature to perform a good weld on my product, and with a MIG welder, you have easy access to adjusting the temperature. I chose to research welding because I, I didn't have any knowledge on welding before, and I wanted to weld my product together because I thought that welding is stronger than bolting it together. Therefore, that is why I researched welding, because I wanted to make sure I had the safety and knowledge before I even decided to start building my product. Some pictures here. In this first picture, I finally got to see my product come together with just the idea in my head. In the next pic picture, I'm welding on my top plate. In, this, in the final picture, I'm standing with my mentor admiring how far we had gotten. Some challenges that occurred would be my mentor time. My mentor is Ray Brown and he owns his own business, therefore it was hard to work around his work hours and my work hours. And I didn't achieve my entire mentor time, but I did get 13 out of 15 hours. Um, the last challenge that I'd like to point out is an injury. As I was building this thing, I hurt my leg. It didn't stop me from building it, but makes you think and uh, make sure you know your knowledge on power tools. Um, here's pictures of my leg. Initially what happened was as I was cutting my strips off, my, my blade got jammed in between the two pieces of metal and it jerked the die grinder out of my hands and it would have cut my leg if it didn't get wrapped up, wrapped up in Stronger. completely functional foot press that allowed me to build, rebuild transmissions more efficiently and quicker to make my dad's life a little less hectic.
Thank you, and do my judges have any questions? I want to see that thing. It works. It's okay. Yes, sir. So this is a 4060 drum out. Mm -hmm. This is a input drum out of a 4060E. And I already took my, my frictions and seals out. And in order to take out my bottom pistons mm -hmm. to replace the seals, I have to push this down mm -hmm. to take the snap ring out. To take uh, you have me. To take a I thought that's how you're supposed to do it. Yeah, <laughs> Make sure they're still working. Mm -hmm. Push it down. To get the snap ring out. I use it all the time. <laughs> hey, it looks like every day to me. <laughs> so let me take my springs out to take my bottom pistons out. And then let's put it back in. this process done before, you yeah. know, without a foot press like this? Oh, well, usually if, uh, at my dad's shop, we mm -hmm. have this, a, uh, can't think of the name of it right now. Uh, it's, it's something additionally like this, except it screws down. Mm -hmm. I can't think mm -hmm. of the name of it, but instead of screwing it down, because it takes forever, because it's, it's a tight process, mm -hmm. and so I, I thought building a foot press would make it a lot quicker, which it is. I don't know what happened. I practiced this earlier, and it was fine. Uh, yeah. It's just Murphy's Law in action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did I hear you say that you're going to work with your dad after? Uh, actually, no. Mm -hmm. I've been working with him for five years, yeah. but I would really like to open my own transmission okay. shop. Right. How many have you personally rebuilt? I honestly quite a few. I, I usually stick to 4L60Es out of a Chevy trans out of a Chevy vehicle. Um, I've actually built a couple, but a couple of my buddy's transmissions. Um, I rebuilt my grandpa's. I probably rebuilt probably a good 20 transmissions. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so um, since you're title here is Knowledge of Fabricating Safety, and you had that little accident. Yes, <laughs> that is why I chose that. <laughs> okay, well, I was just wondering, like, what could you have done to prevent that? Um, I probably could have looked up, because since, since I didn't have really a mentor there to help me out, I didn't really know how to use prior tools, other than, you know, a simple impact or something. But uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that, that the blade could get jammed. Mm -hmm. And so I probably research more on like power tools and how to take precautions, how to stand away from them if they do get jerked out of your hands, to hold them a little bit tighter. <laughs> get large shafts or other shafts. Face mask. Yeah, face mask. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive. Well, and I'm just real impressed. I mean, it's it's really obvious that you know your way around the stuff and the way that you put things in, took it around, manipulated it. And it was a lot cheaper than buying a new one. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's smart business. You did well. Good job. All right. Thank you.
see how you grade them, then we'll see the comments. So I'll see. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. You're going to be okay? I'm going to stay back here. Yeah, yeah, all right. I got it. Check. Appreciate it. You stand in here? No, we don't. I'm on the ground. Look at him. Good to meet you all. You too. Again, I guess. We're going to spend two more than you with. I'm out here, right? <laughs> This is a clip on. Okay. Sadly, I don't have any bow ties that I can tie. Okay. Well, one out of three of that, I gotta keep asking the question. <laughs> All right. I can't tie one, that's what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. I've heard they're not too difficult, but I've just I've heard said it was like shoestrings, tennis shoestrings. So I think I can do that. Yeah. I'll just go out and buy one and give it a shot. Yeah. See what happens. Yep. Thanks for the Wichita State colors.
about the studio. Yeah. Someone told me that. I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah. Change the name and everything. Christine was talking about ballet, so I just thought that was good. We are the three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're we're good just passing by. Stopping in every once in a while so Martin can pick up the girls and make them feel special. No, she really likes Tommy. Yes, we miss Tommy. Mm -hmm. that, that is for sure. Tommy talked to her a while. She's doing okay. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, I have her on Facebook. Oh. So. Not on Facebook, so. Yeah. Tommy so made me really know. good at dodging yeah. items. It at what? Well. At dodging yeah. items. No, she was throwing things at me. Oh. Well, there's hardly anything up here, so she wouldn't have to do much dodging. Yeah. For example, I can remember my father telling me stories about how he would take me with him to his music rehearsals, whether it be the church that he performed with or whether it be just his friends that he would play in the band with. And I remember every time I went to a rehearsal, I would sleep through the entire rehearsal. And I feel like this kind of foundation that music has given me has allowed me to have an advantage in the classroom or on a cultural level and has allowed me to be able to better control my emotions as well. And I feel like since music, in a sense, made me, I might as well return the favor and make the music. Now, the reason I chose music was because, like I stated, I have a very long history of music. Uh, on a, for an example, on my mom's side, there is a long line of musicians and music teachers. And then on my dad's side, well, if you went to Mexico and threw a rock, you could hit five different bands. <laughs> Pretty much, if you can live and breathe down in Mexico, you can play an instrument. And another reason why I decided to choose music is my love and my passion for what I do. I have been with the Willow Springs Band for about seven years, and I've been with the Willow Springs Marching Band for about five. And throughout all these years, I have met countless amounts of amazing people, and I've had countless amount of experiences most of which came through when I joined the marching band and had been placed in playing the tuba. And this instrument has opened a world for me to be able to express myself and to be able to just meet amazing people all throughout our state and in some cases our country. And throughout all these experiences I've gained such a deep love for the instrument I play and for the music I can play with it. Now, Music has many benefits to a person's mind. It can broaden a person's experiences culturally, it can affect a person's emotion, and it is an advantage intellectually for a person. Primarily, starting off with the culture, there was a study held in Pinecrest Elementary School. And this study was conducted in around 2012. And the scientists had gone in and completely changed up the music program in that school. And with that change, they were, scientists brought in different cultural important songs, such as La Casa Blanca and our very own Star Spangled Banner. Now, 
This affected the children very positively in broadening their horizon on the world they live in and the people within this world. This also affected the children in the sense that they gained a very cultural, a very prominent cultural pr pride for their own culture and for the place they live in. Now, secondly, is in terms of emotion. There was a science experiment held in Siberia by two scientists, and the way they conducted this is they had a film and they had music pairing with the film. For example, they used a horror clip, so of course they would use suspenseful music to pair with that. And the kind of independent variable for this experiment is they replaced the original music film with a different kind of music. And the effect they've seen on this is it completely alters the viewer's perspective on the film, depending on what kind of music they were playing. So for example, they started out with the suspenseful music, they then replaced it with a happy-go-lucky, upbeat kind of tune, and it completely changed the viewer's reaction to this. Another example is I had interviewed our very own Dr. Spence and asked him why he plays music at the beginning of school and between class periods. And he believes that music has the ability to relax a person and allow a person to <clears throat> get their mind prepared to spend their entire day learning. He also stated that music has the ability to motivate a student to be able to want to go to the classroom and want to dive deep into their subjects. And that brings me on to the next point, which is a person's intelligence. Music has a way of adding a certain rhythm and pattern to the kind of information the student can learn. And in this case, it allows the student to be able to remember that information a lot easier. For example, there's always that tune that you can only remember that certain piece of the song, but you can never remember the full song. And it's just because that rhythm has been so catchy and you've heard it too, so many times that it's just embedded in your mind. Now, all of this research had brought me to my product, which is this sousaphone. Now, this sousaphone is a very important part of Willow Springs musical history. This was a part of the pair of sousaphones that the late, doctor, or the late Mr. East had purchased during his time at Willow Springs. And I know that Mr. East was a very influential part of Willow Springs history and had impacted so many people. So I feel like bringing back this bit of history was not only doing the school a favor, but doing a lot of people in our community a favor and reminding them about the times and experiences they could have experienced from listening to this sousaphone. Another aspect of this sousaphone is due to the fact that its piping and metal is made entirely of brass it can allow us to inference whether it was, or it can allow us to inference at what time period it was constructed, which, due to the fact that recent instruments are not built completely of brass, mainly with just a brass coloring, we can inference that this sousaphone was built around the 30s or 50s. Now, this sousaphone was no simple task to completely repair and refurbish. Before I go into it, I have to explain a little, some slight anatomy of the sousaphone. Starting out over here, this circular part is called the bell. And then where this curves is just the body, and then right here is the pipe. Now starting off, I had to clean the entire instrument. And any kind of grime, smut, or skid marks a piece of fiberglass could absorb, whether it was being used or in storage, this sousaphone had managed to get a hold of that. <laughs> and so my main use to getting rid of all the grime was a type of spray called Goo Gone. That worked pretty effectively and helped me quite a bit. A uh, way I got rid of the skid marks is a type of wipes called graffiti wipes, which are a gridded type of wipe that really just scrubs away at it, but thankfully did not rub off any of the paint. One of my main issues during cleaning was around the bell, as you can see here, there was just a ton of goo from just glue that had not been cleaned or kept up in any way for quite some time. And at the bottom of the sousaphone. As you can see right here, this area touches the ground quite a bit and due to the amount that it was used during Mr. East time, it had gotten a ton of cracks and breaks. And so the way they repaired it, is they just slapped some duct tape on there and spray painted it and <laughs> called it a day. And through the, throughout this entire experience, I had learned that adhesive from the 70s is not fun to remove. Yeah. But thankfully, because of the Goo Gone and the graffiti wipes, I had managed to get it off. Now, in terms of the next step was repairing. 
as you can see here, this is what underneath that duct tape with a little bit of adhesive still left on it looked like. And then that big crack in the top right corner was actually on the back side of the bell right here, which is another very common spot for the sousaphone to touch the ground. For the repairing aspect, I had very little idea on what to do. I am not a very handy man, and so I was not experienced in how to fix fiberglass or how to fix piping or anything like that. But because of the help of my mentor and the help of Mr. Foster at his auto body shop, they had both allowed me to learn how to repair the fiberglass efficiently so that way we can paint over it later. And then as I stated earlier, I had to repair a bit of piping. On the sousaphone where the body meets the piping right here, there was a big crack and this two, these two parts were just entirely separated. Now they had started off by putting a bit of Bondo on there and it did not work out well. And they decided just leave the Bondo on there and leave it broken. So I had to go in and chip off the Bondo and then Mr. Walden, our ag teacher, had taught me how to solder and had helped me solder the two pieces together. Now after the repairing aspect, I had then gone into styling the instrument. Initially, it was just a very bland, white, eggshell white kind of color all around. And I felt like it was doing the instrument a disservice due to the fact of its antique use of brass. So I had gone through and sanded the entire instrument, and I would found out an orbital sander is my best friend for this project. <laughs> and I used the orbital sander to polish and sand off these rings to expose that brass. And then I had also found out that black is a very good uh, very good color to match with brass. And then these two pictures you can see me going through the finishing touches and painting off some parts that got chipped off a little bit. And through here is a bit of the beginner products. You can see this is where the Seuss phone sat for years. It just hung up in the band room collecting dust. And after all my years of going to that same band room, I had started to sympathize for the sousaphone and <laughs> I wanted to see it back to its former glory. And here you can see the original white color, and they decided to even paint the brass piping to a strange brown. They decided to paint it brown instead of keep the brass piping. And here is the final product. I am very happy with how this turned out. And those some things came along that altered the finished product, I feel like that it still ended up pretty well. As I stated, some things did come and mess up a couple of instances. Primarily my inexperience. As I stated before, I am not a handyman kind of kid and I had no idea how to do all any of this. This entire experience has been so educational to me thanks to my mentor and multiple other people who had guided me through the process of cleaning the instrument, of repairing uh, fiberglass and uh, soldering and all the pipe work. My second main issue was company cooperation. There is a music center in Springfield called Palin's Music Center, and I had, I had talked to them to see if they could help me out and see if they had a piece. In fact, I was looking for this piece and see if they had one in storage that I could purchase from them. They had held my instrument for three months <laughs> and told me there was nothing they could do for me. So throughout all that time lost, it was difficult to keep up with the deadlines, but I managed to move through that time lost and finish the project on time. And I'd also managed to find a replacement piece, as you can see right here. Now, with all the things that I do, whether it be in school or music, I hope that I can inspire the younger generations of children to get more active in music and be affected by music in the way I have to allow them to feel the same benefits that I have. Thank you. <coughs> yes? Um, you said there was a pair of sousaphones, so where's the other one? The other one is still in the band room. It is in its original shape. I have not taken too much of a look at it, but it was not as bad off as this one is. Okay. The other one is still in one piece, thankfully. Oh. And so, um, What's the difference between playing a sousaphone and a regular tuba? Um, the sousaphone that I have here, it is very iconic for its winding structure. And as you can see, well, those pictures are rather small. As you can see, 
through here, right. it wraps around the actual player. Mm -hmm. For the regular tuba, are you referencing the tuba we use for our marching band current? Mm -hmm. That is called the contra tuba. And it is used in a lot of colleges and is used very professionally in Drum Corps International and other international competitions. And the main difference is the body structure. That one, while it curves around the player, the contra tuba is set up as any other horn would be, and all the piping is set out with itself. And the instrument goes on the player's shoulder as they play, and then when they're out of attention, the player holds up the entire instrument. Any other questions? What's going to happen with that horn now? That one, I hope to take it off of Cochran's hands, so that <laughs> way... <laughs> That's a good plan. Yeah. So that way I can use it for whatever future I might have with it, whether it be performing at my church or just any kind of jazz or concert group that I decide to go with. It also fittingly matches my future plans, which I have managed to be able to make it into the University of Missouri in Columbia. Thank you. And the brass and black match very fittingly with the black and yellow for Mizzou. Yes. You mentioned at the very beginning that you were given the tuba. Was that an instrument you wanted, or would you have chosen something else? Um, and if so, what? Starting out in, sixth, in fifth grade, Cochrane allows you to choose what instrument you want. And if he feels you perform better at a different instrument, he will give you that other instrument. I initially tested to be a saxophone player, but Cochrane told me that I had the facial frame of a brass player, so he put me on the trombone. Once I had gone into eighth grade, I had been selected to go into the high school marching band, where I was going to play the baritone, but we had lost two of our senior tuba players for the season. So Cochran, halfway through our last band camp, at five in the morning, told me I was playing the tuba. <laughs> and since then, I had fallen in love with the instrument and the kind of music it can play and the kind of sound it can produce. Any other questions? Yes? What's the best life lesson you learned that you can use for your future? Um, throughout marching band entirely, the best life, life lesson I can learn is that if you make a mistake, to move on to the rest of the show. For marching band, if you are mid-performance in a competition and you hit the wrong note, you can't stop and redo the rest of the performance. You have to keep moving through the show. And I believe that this has allowed me to learn to just keep moving forward for the rest of the show. Any other questions? I was in the marching band here in the late, mid to late 60s, mm -hmm. and this is what we had. Mm -hmm. Then I'd be curious to know when they went to the Contra. To um, do you I'm aware. I was told that uh, there was a couple band directors between Mr. East and Mr. Cochran, and I wasn't sure if there was the change during that point or if the change happened after Mr. Cochran became band director. But I know Mr. Cochran did change from the Sousa to the Contra because he felt like for a marching scenario, the Contra had a better direction of the music. For the sousaphone, we still use it for jazz performances and other instances like that because it can, it has a very broad targeting for the music to go. The sound waves can branch off any way they want to. For the Contra tuba, it is very direct and in cases of where we perform at uh, Missouri State University or as it was previously known, uh, Southern Missouri State, uh, it is very good at letting the music reach to the stands because of its very direct way of traveling music. Any other questions? Yes. So what's your favorite kind of music to play on the tube or a sousaphone? Oh, oh, man. I really enjoy, it's a mix of two worlds. I, for the sousaphone and the tuba both, I love playing ballads where you can really get your entire emotion into the music and just really express the music. Because one thing that I learned very early on is this instrument will play music to how your emotion feels. And so every performance is just a roller coaster of emotions, trying to feel what the music is. And on top of that, on the opposite end of ballads, I really enjoy just powerful, hard-hitting music. Music that just gets in your face and makes the audience jump back a little bit. Because it gives that kind of powerful tone. Any other questions? Do you get to play this at the concert? Yes. Mm -hmm. Our concert is going to be this Sunday at 2 o'clock. And I will be playing this instrument starting off with uh, Oh When the Saints Go Marching In, 
I will be leading that song on. And then we will then play a second song called St. Louis Blues. And within that song, I will be having a sousaphone uh, solo. And then after that, we play a song called Sing, 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 which is a very upbeat, get on your feet and dance kind of jazz piece. Any other questions? Thank you very much. She would make it so fun and interesting and engaging for me to listen to, and it made me want to read more often. And I would always ask her, hey, when can we read again? When can we read again? Which kind of led to the books aplenty. I was never out of books. If I found a book that I didn't know, I was like, hey, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read this, or I'm going to have my mom help me read it. <laughs> because at that time, you know, whenever you're young, you don't know how to read that well, so you have a bit of issues. 
So I'd like to start off by saying that it helps give that special bond. For me, it helped strengthen my bond with my mother because she would help me understand the words I didn't know and she would kind of help me connect with the books a little bit better than I probably would have. So it kind of helped get that uh, intimacy and stability. So whenever a baby is born, they are naturally attracted to their mother, whether it be by the sound of her voice or as weird as it seems, her smell. Now. We did, uh, in psychology, we went over a study that was done where they would take uh, the pad of a woman's uh, bra for the breast milk and the child would naturally be attracted to it. So it kind of helped show that they would be attracted to the smell, which if you think about it, we were all weird at one point. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that would like to lead me to a happy and healthy conversation and lifestyle. Uh, as they're growing up, children, it may be hard for them to kind of understand and kind of connect with their parents in a way. Um, there was a woman who had a two-year-old son that she would read to, and he didn't know how to properly express his emotions, so he would use the different books that he had read with his mother to kind of give her that hint. There was a specific book that he would use whenever he was sad or upset, and he would always bring it to her, and she would know kind of how to help him because he couldn't properly say, well, mom, I'm sad, I don't know how to deal with this. So he kind of found it as a way to stem a little bit of healthier understanding between the two. <coughs> um, whenever we were also in psychology talking about the development of children, we hit on a Swiss psychologist, John Piaget, he had this four stages of the uh, growth of a child's mind, and he had done a study where he would take kids into a room and have them read. So there would either be, if they were too young to read, there would be an audio recording, something that they hadn't heard before, and it would be something like very like space related or something that's not really here on earth that they could do. So then after they did that, they would put them in a room and typically the story that they had just read, it would, they would take the toys that they found in the room and they would kind of act out what they just heard. So it kind of helped them escape their own reality in a way and it kind of helped stem that creativity that most children have. If you've ever walked into a room of kids, they're all doing something different but somehow it just works. And it kind of gives a better understanding for us to see how it kind of helps develop their minds so we can kind of get a better understanding of helping them if they're like any sort of like, like a learning disability or anything. It kind of helps us figure out, well, what can we do to get them to where they can do it better? <coughs> so it gives them a boost in school. My second grade A plus kids, I have to have them read to me for certain like tests if they miss them. And there are quite a few of them that have trouble saying certain words. And they're more of the typical words that we would use in every day that they would hear, but they just don't quite understand them. While others in the class, they would read it perfectly fine without a hiccup. And so I'd ask my kids that day, I said, do you guys read at home a lot? Or are you more going outside and playing? And the ones who read very well said they would read at home with their parents a lot. And the ones that did have a hiccup, they were more of the, I don't want to read, I don't like reading that much. So it kind of shows that they didn't really get to learn that understanding of like the alphabet, for instance. Whenever you're looking at a word, you pick it apart piece by piece. You look at the individual letters whenever you're young to kind of get the word into your head where you understand what it means for the next time that you see it. So it also kind of helps them get that boost in the alphabet so they understand sooner than most what the alphabet is and what the letters are in the, in the alphabet. <laughs> so with the kids that I had read it there, like with their parents at home, I'd ask them if they absolutely loved reading, if they'd do that over anything else. And most of the kids said, yeah, they found it very enjoyable. For me personally, reading is very, very enjoyable. I would much rather curl up in some corner with a book 
all cozy and snug than go outside and play, or on the rare occasions I'd take my book to a tree and read, <laughs> then get a little bit of sunshine and reading in. <laughs> but it kind of helped me learn that a little bit of independence, so I would break away from having to go ask my mom, hey, what's this word so much? I kind of learned how to find it on my own, that way I could feel really proud of myself whenever I went up and said, hey, I know what this word means, kind of showing off, saying, yeah, I looked it up, I didn't need you, I got this on my own. <laughs> Which leads me to my product today. So I decided to write a book for my A plus students, and it was pretty fun to do, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't think it would be as enjoyable as some other topics that I would write about, but I found it very fun because I would ask my kids, hey, what's something you guys all like as a class? They sprouted ideas from dinosaurs to space to race cars. They went from every angle they possibly could. And finally, my teacher said, well, what about a circus? Because it's like a madhouse in here. And they all thought it was funny, and they loved it. And they were like, oh, yeah, 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 write about a circus. That'll do. So I said, you know, I can write about a circus. I like circuses, and they all loved the idea. So it was kind of a rare moment to find something they all agreed on. Because typically, if you t ask a child one question, you got 20 different answers. They're never, they can never decide properly on something. Um, after I'd gotten the idea for the circus, I asked them, so what are two animals that you guys like? And I came across a common two, elephants and kittens. So I said, I can write about an elephant and a kitten. Circus, elephant, perfect. But then I got to thinking, well, how can I incorporate a kitten into this? Because that's just kind of an oddball in there. But after uh, <laughs> thinking a few times and rewriting and rewriting my book, I finally came across a pretty good balance between the two. So the hardships that I first had was my writing style changing. If you have read any of my stuff, you can realize very quickly it's not meant for younger children, it's not meant for elementary, it's more of like eighth grade, high school, you know, young adult level. And it kind of, I use some big words that little kids may not understand, so it was kind of hard to get it to where I could write it for, say, if a fourth grader wanted to read it, that way they could read it, understand, you know, what the book was about, and if they wanted to read it to their younger siblings, that way they can read it to them and the younger sibling can also understand, which kind of helps that strengthening bond between kids and then they can grow up together wanting to read to each other or reading to their parents. So <laughs> with my uh, trying to find a good storyline that would fit both the elephant and the kitten into it equally, I came across a lot of writer's block. I'd start writing an idea and I'd go, yeah, I really like this, this is going somewhere. Next day, I don't know where this was going. It just kind of took over without me. So I had to scrap it and start over again where I would do the same process a couple times a day and I'd just go, oh, I really can't think of something that was good. But eventually I found my happy medium and I wrote my book about this elephant who is new to the circus. It's the first animal they've had in the circus so he, the ringmaster keeps it a secret, and then on the big day of the show, he says, hey, we got an elephant, and everybody just goes wild. And there's a flood in the few days before they leave, and so the elephant kind of walks around town, and he's, he's a little guy, so he loves, you know, going exploring, and he hears this crying in a drainage ditch, and he goes and runs to see, hey, what is that? And he finds three kittens. So he immediately is like, uh, I don't think they should be in there. That's probably not where they go. So he rescues them and takes them back to the circus. And they're the two older ones, they kind of are curled up together, but he sees the one on its own. So he says, I'm gonna keep you. You're gonna be with me. I'm gonna take care of you. So he finds a home for the other two and he keeps the kitten hidden until they get to the next town. And he's out, you know, doing his own little thing, exploring and finally comes back, and the ringmaster's sitting there with the kitten, and he says, 
I feel bad taking him from you. So we got a kitten. And so he, you know, walks around all proud, showing off the kitten, and everybody's laughing and loving the attention. And it kind of helped. My point of the book was to teach the kids that friendships come in some of the most unlikely of places. Mm -hmm. So you never know who you could end up being friends with. It could be somebody you didn't even like in elementary, and then boom, you grow your best friends. You don't know how it's going to play out. And after telling that storyline to a few of my, well not my friends, a few of my peers and a couple teachers, they had some criticism. They didn't really understand why I was writing it the way that I was, but it was kind of hard to see, make them see it from my point of view, so I kind of took a little bit here and there and fixed it to where everybody kind of came to the general idea of understanding what my book was about and why I wrote it. <coughs> So I'd like to end this by saying that George R. R. Martin once said, the man that reads lives a thousand lives, the man that doesn't lives only one. So by helping our children read and get a better understanding of the world around them, it can help them grow up to be incredible people within a limit that cannot be reached with their creativity and they can be anything that they want if they just put their mind to it. Do my judges have any questions? I do. So your second grade was um, your point, or they helped you with developing the story, the idea. Yes. So did you read it to them? I was going to the last day. It was going to be a surprise. I was going to read it to them the last day that I was in the class with them because they are all, the first day I walked in with my, uh, after we were told about senior projects, my teacher immediately was like, so what you going to do for your senior project? And I was like, I'm going to write a book. And they all wanted to be in it. And I was like, well, I can't write a book about all of you. There's like, what, 30 of you? So that's going to be a long book. And as you know, children, they don't have a good attention span, typically. But um, it was <laughs> it's kind of difficult. But yeah, I was planning on reading it to them the last day that I was there to kind of give a farewell that they might enjoy. I'd be interested to hear their critiques. Yeah. I bet they won't be as harsh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably not. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Emily, what do you plan to do after high school? Uh, I haven't listened to the military. Um, April 8th is whenever I was sworn in the first time. Uh, I leave March 18th, or not March. I've been saying March all day. I leave May 18th, so I'll go up to St. Louis May 17th and get on a plane and fly to South Carolina. It's going to get hot real fast, <laughs> and I'm not going to be used to it. But um, after that, I don't know yet. <laughs> Got to get there first. <laughs> I hope you continue to share your enthusiasm and reading. Yeah, I plan on it. I try to get my kids to read to me a lot. They, uh, most of them will just come up to me and ask during their free time if they can read. And I'm like, by all means, I don't care how many of you there are. Pull up a chair, we'll read. I'll pay attention to everybody. <laughs> Bonneman, I saw your hand raised. Why don't Brooke and I have copies yet? <laughs> Why don't I have one? <laughs> um, because it takes quite a long time to get these printed and oh. cut out the correct <laughs> way. I was there helping you. <laughs> hey, yeah, we'll talk about that. Do you plan on publishing them? Um, or trying? Checking it out. Kind of had it, a, yeah. Uh, was it sophomore year or was it junior? I think it was sophomore, sophomore. year. Um, whenever Miss Berry started her extended creative writing, we, the class as a whole, uh, would start writing a book and we were actually going through the steps of publishing it, so we kind of understood how to publish it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I thought if enough people liked it, then I might see who else might like it. and. Ms. Berry actually said that she has a friend, I think she said in Texas, that teaches younger kids. So she was like, can I send a copy of the book down there? And I was like, sure. So awesome. that might help me a little bit. Yeah. Brooke. Are you interested in pursuing writing in any way? As a hobby, I don't know if I would be able to make a part-time career out of it, you know, because it'd be a, it's, it's quite, it'd be quite a long time to get a good enough sized book written that I'd be really proud of, you know? And I don't know if I'll have that kind of time. Jaden? <laughs> wow. Okay. Have you ever been 
considered writing more children's books? Because, you know, they're kind of shorter. <laughs> <laughs> it was difficult enough to write this one. I know. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> but um, maybe. We'll see. Do you have a favorite book or author? Mm, that's a really <clears throat> tough question. Um, there was a book that for like a long time I was stuck on reading by, um, I want to say her name is Elizabeth Lowell. It's a book called No Time to Die, or Always Time to Die. I thought it was a really good book. It sounds a little weird in the title, but I thought it was pretty enjoyable, but I'm kind of more the person who likes that kind of stuff, like that finds murder stuff kind of interesting. <laughs> Erica? Okay, I have kind of two questions. Okay. Um, if anyone follows that last question. <laughs> yeah. But um, what if you're, uh, the, all the younger kids read it, the kids in Texas read it, and they wanted a sequel, would you make a sequel? Perhaps. <laughs> and then, uh, since you like like older mystery stuff, mm -hmm. would you ever make an adult version of that? <laughs> <laughs> and make it like a mystery? <laughs> um, um, <laughs> it would be interesting to take because actually in our uh, extended creative writing class we chose um, popular, not really popular, but we could choose like children's stories and kind of put our own twist on them. What I started to do was I chose Blue Red Riding Hood and I made it to where Red wasn't the villain, but, or, but Red was the villain. So. I don't know, maybe, in my work. <laughs> okay, I'd like to thank you, Emily. Oh, yeah, thank you. I forgot that, I had my work cited. I forgot, I forgot that I was supposed too. to click it. I was hoping you it. Right. 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 You really ought to look at early childhood. Yeah. And also, it works with reading. Yeah, somebody had already talked Christian Publishing Center. <laughs> so, um, somebody here had already talked to somebody about like posts and stuff. She was like, oh, I just wanted to do it to see how it's like. She's over here like, sorry, nudge, nudge. And I'm like, mom. <laughs> really? But yeah. So. Did you just click her? She kind of left. How'd yours go? Where did I think? Y'all can go. Y'all can go. You don't have to wait on me. Hey, hey, hey. Hi, Emily. I'll see you later. He's super confused. You might want to explain stuff to him. What am I confused about? Tomorrow. Oh, okay. Ready? Ready? All my judges ready? 
Yes. Okay, picture this. You're driving home one night, late night after work, it's probably 9.30, 9.45, you're going about 65, 70 mile an hour on the highway, and then you see an odd orange light flicker on your dash. And at that point, you realize your check engine lights came on, and you begin to wonder whether or not you should pull over, <laughs> limp at home, continue driving just as you were, whether you should just go ahead and call a tow truck and get it on its way. I'm Benjamin Ivins, and I'm here to talk to you all about the cost of consumerism. In this case, the cost of consumerism uh, referred to the check engine light and whether or not I should pay to have the expedited process and have a shop check my engine for me and do any repairs or whether I should do it myself. And in this instance, I chose to do it myself. I went to Walmart and I bought myself a code reader and I realized I was not getting enough fuel to my motor and simply had a clogged fuel filter. This cost me $11 in parts and $40 for a code reader whereas it probably would have been 50 more dollars just for a diagnosis at a shop. There are many things that consumerism has leached into our lives and taken from us. One of these is the right to repair. Mm -hmm. An instance of this is where John Deere claims that the owners of the tractors don't really own the tractors, but rather they, like, they lease them for the lifetime of the product. They say this because they have GPS software that John Deere programmed into them themselves. John Deere claims that this is their intellectual property and that the owners really do not own the tractor because John Deere owns the software on it. As such, they charge special prices and high prices at that for diagnostic software and rather to do any repairs. An example of this was Gus Johnson. Gus Johnson is a farmer in Nebraska who had to call John Deere out after his tractor cut to 50% power capacity. After three days of crop loss, John Deere showed up to Gus Johnson's farm, and they diagnosed that he had water in the diesel exhaust fluid tank, a matter that simply could have been fixed by draining the tank and refilling it with diesel exhaust fluid. But rather, it cost Gus Johnson $3,500 as he had to have John Deere come out and diagnose it and repair it with their equipment. What it simply boils down to is the fact that John Deere gains more money out of this. John Deere can basically extort the owner of the product as they are the only one with access to the software and the means of fixing it. Apple has followed this process similarly as they use special tools to repair any iPhones and will lock the software on iPhones should you try and repair it yourself. Another thing that the cost of consumerism has brought upon us is a lack of the ability to save money. The longer people go without repairing their own products, the more the companies make it harder to repair. What it has caused is it has caused it to where for somebody to save money and do it themselves, they often have to buy an expensive tool and almost just break even, making it to where the only point in trying to do it yourself is if you're going to do it multiple times. Examples of ways that you save money would be stuff such as general vehicle maintenance. So this would be changing your own oil, checking your own fuses, checking your own vehicle belts, or even tackling small projects yourself such as I did when I built an eight-foot flatbed tray. This is an example of where instead of expediting the process and just going to a local store such as Tractor Supply and buying a rebuilt trailer, I built it myself and saved approximately $650. When I did this, it allowed me to have my own quality control aspect. It let me ensure that every bead that I put on this trailer was up to my standards and up to my spec and that I could be proud of it and safe and ensured when I drove that product down the road. When I drive my trailer down the road, I know that it will not fall apart on me, there will not be a weld give, and I was assured of this by the Missouri State Highway Patrol Troop G when I took it to them and had them inspect it. Whenever you do something yourself, you can choose your own material. Whether it is changing your car's oil and you choose the brand of the filter, or whether it is constructing it yourself, such as I did, where I used 3 16 by 3, three inch C-channel, instead of eight inch angle iron, such as tractor supply would use on their trailers. This provides me with a sense of security and an extremely rigid trailer that I am more comfortable pulling down the road than one such as that you can purchase a tractor supply. Finally, it lets you fulfill your own standards. I know that I am more proud to pull down a trailer such as the one I built where it's gonna be more rigid and it's gonna be made of firmer material than I would be to pull a flimsier one from tractor supply. And I also know that I built it myself. Finally, you can also choose the method, such as where I chose to do 
stick welding was 7018 rods. This allowed me to have 70,000 PSI of tensile strength at every joint of this trailer, whereas it would have probably done with, been done with a core flux MIG welder at any standard plant where they would build the trailer. Finally, you can also choose the planes. In this, I drew up these planes with the help of my mentor, and while they are rather simple, they were very effective plans, and there are multiple cross braces to ensure rigidity. This project benefited me in many ways, the first of which was that it was monetarily beneficial. I saved a large amount of money, as I said previously, between five and six hundred dollars by doing this myself, and it also gave me a more rigid and firm trailer that I'm more comfortable to haul my property with. Stuff that I haul this, with this trailer include our John Deere Gator, two of our lawnmowers that I used to mow my grandmother's lawn, and then multiple four-wheelers that I take back and forth from the farm to my house in order to repair them. Furthermore, this gave me a sense of pride. I knew that this was a trailer that I built. I was very proud of every beat on this trailer, and I am very proud that I was able to tackle such a large project when I had relatively no experience in this subject going on. I came out with an eight foot flatbed trailer that has a three foot by four foot drop down gate. This is a trailer that I'm very proud to haul. I will hook it up, in, up to any trailer and pull any distance and will not hesitate a bit. I'm extremely proud of this trailer and I believe that I did an excellent job on it. I use this, I use this trailer for hauling any products such as I said, John Deere gators, four wheelers and lawnmowers. And I built it completely from scratch. I started with $365 worth of steel from Pipes Plus in Missouri and an axle that I salvaged from an old camper that we had out behind my house. I turned that into my final product. Here you can see this is the trailer before I put down the floorboards and the rear gate, but after I had done all the wiring, all the welding, all the framework, and put up the frame rails. The materials I bought were approximately 35 foot of C-channel steel, 80 foot of eighth inch angle iron, an expanded metal sheet, one hitch receiver, and one hitch jack. These materials, plus uh, two fender wells and their backings, were all that I needed to build this trailer, as I already had the axle salvaged. Here you can see a picture of the materials when I brought them home from Pipes Plus. That is $365 sitting on the bed of a 16-foot trailer. We had to use that 16-foot trailer for every time we had to haul something, even as small as a lawnmower, and we had to spend time ratchet strapping everything down just to haul a lawnmower about 10 miles to my grandmother's house every time. That was the inspiration for me building my project. And here you can see my project just before it's finished, just before the drop-down gate and the paint. The challenges that I ran into when building my product is, before this, I did not really have any welding experience. Uh, the last time I had welded was in the ag class in eighth grade. <laughs> and uh, when I tackled this project, I knew it was going to be more difficult, but my mentor helped me a large amount. He was a former pipeline welder named Nicholas Riviello. He's the best welder I know, and he helped me immensely on this project and took it to where instead of looking like little bitty lumps and beads, I actually have welds that if I put on a piece of plate steel, I would be proud to show any one of y'all today. Another challenge that I ran into was planning. I had never drawn blueprints for anything similar to this. And as you can see here, like I said, they are relatively simple, but they were effective blueprints and he gave me a, a good foundation to start on and to begin with my product. In conclusion, what I found is that oftentimes it can benefit you in more ways than just saving you money, as long as you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of time and move on, such as, with my check engine light and my pickup, where instead of spending hundreds of dollars just to pay a mechanic to put a fuel filter in, I used a wrench and two hours out of my day and paid $61. Thank you. Do my judges have any questions? Do you want to buy my tractor <laughs> supply trailer? <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you to fill the trailer? I believe when I tallied it up, I had about 90 hours in it. You said that's the first time you've done any welding since eighth grade. Is that something that you want to do in the future? I really enjoyed it. And it, it made me look into careers such as boiler making and uh, pipeline welding, which pipeline welding isn't really an option right now. But. Um, talk to me after this is over with, because I help with training for you. OK. Ben, did you paint your trailer too? I did paint the trailer myself. I used uh, enamel paint from the tractor supply.
Had you done that before? I had not, and it turned out not too streaky, and I was pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if y'all would like to, I can take y'all right out here out to the middle school playground and show y'all it. Better set this here. If you want, I can go ahead and take the questions before we head on out there. Have you learned how to back it up pretty good? Yes, sir. <laughs> that, that took a little bit of learning. I had gotten pretty good at the 16-foot one, but I found a single axle turns a heck of a lot faster than a, yeah. than a double axle. Yeah. Right. What kind of lever did you use for the floor? I just used a uh, Yellowwood 2 for 6 It's the cheapest I could get because it's pretty high right now. <laughs> So how much time did it save you now, instead of having to hook up that 16-foot one? That, it saved me a lot of time. The 16-foot one, it didn't really take too long to hook up to, but it has two 50-pound angle iron ramps, and every time you wanted to hook a lawnmower on there, you either had to dig one of those or go to the shop and get the aluminum ramps out of there to load it up. And then whenever you pulled it on there, you had to put ratchet straps on it because our 16-footer doesn't have rails. So I was very happy I put about foot tall rails on this trailer and I don't really worry about ratchet strapping it down too much. You just get it tight enough to ride. We're all right. So you married Uh-huh. Yeah. Mike Carrick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so Brenda, do we just hang on to these? Or? Uh, yes, you're welcome to keep them or I collect them. It okay. doesn't matter. No. So. Okay. Thank you. I, I'll Good stay job, in here to watch you. I'll, I'll finish you? mine, so. Oh, okay.
what I did online.